<laughs> okay, I'll let you go in with it. All right. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Design Chat number 15. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the Design Chat is the best live weekly design discussion for creative professionals. That's a fancy little line I just came up with. So tell me if that stinks or not. Um, I'm your host, Ryan McGovern. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Um, design Chat lives on uh, designchat.info. And uh, tonight, uh, Mr. Pete Cashmore of Mashable.com has joined us. This is amazing. Pete, thank you again for coming. This is really cool to be able to talk to you. Um, so to again, thank you, yeah. Awesome. Um, and I am, if you don't know, at Mashable on Twitter and run a blog called uh, Mashable, which covers social media topics and hosts this chat. Just in case nobody knows who you are, Mashable.com, yes. that I can't, reading back the story, like looking it up, you know, this past week of what you were able to accomplish in the short time that you did, um, you know, just, it just astounds me every time I read it, you know. Um, so it was 2005, right, when you started? Uh, yep, uh, kind of July 2005, so we just turned four this week. Happy birthday. Um, thank you. It's our bloggy birthday. Um, yeah, the blog turned four uh, this week, and we've kind of been just building up to being you know, one of the biggest blogs in the world covering social media topics, and uh, it's been a real growth market, so we've kind of ridden that wave of social networking really catching on. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so in your fourth year now, um, I'm sure that you have been uh, participating in some way or another with the design uh, of Mashable.com. And not, when I say design, I don't mean just visual aesthetic. Um, I'm talking about how you interact with the site, um, how, the, how you design the social media part of it. Because in addition to talking about social media, you're doing social media and you're interacting with your audience. Um, tell me a little bit about that process and, and, and how you see it from the design end. I, you know, I think a, a really valuable thing to speak about might actually be um, the mistakes we've made along the way in terms of design. I mean, when you're kind of uh, a novice and starting out, you're like, okay, let's add, you know, fancy things and let's try and uh, you know, make it really cool. And we had this thing, you know, to start with, which was a ribbon along the top. And we've done, you know, all kinds of tricks. And I think when it comes down to it, what you really want to do is just get people to the content as fast as possible. And that's something we have been working on and something we're continuing to work on. I mean, we're still kind of frustrated by things like site speed. And we're working with our, uh, our um, CDN to, you know, speed things up. I think, you know, for blogs and from our perspective, I, I think, you know, working on getting the content to people is the key thing and not having too much extraneous stuff. Um, you know, I think there are there are people who have done it really well. I'm quite a fan of, you know, Smashing Magazine's design. I know people are kind of, uh, you know, mixed on things like that. Uh, you know, I think design is a kind of a very subjective thing, but when you're, when you're talking about layout and things, you just want to get the content to people. Right, right. Um, I think, you know, we could also talk to uh, kind of how we look at things when, you know, when we're reviewing them on Mashable. Obviously, design is something that we have a sense of very early on and that we have a sense of, um, you know, whether we're going to review something based on does it kind of communicate what the site's about instantly. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are certain markers, I guess, we look for. Um, but I think, you know, design is really just about communicating what you are and who you're about and whether it's a quality proposition. I think, you know, one of the things when we're reviewing sites is you get an instant feel of, okay, this has really solid design. It's probably something I want to dig into as opposed to hey, it's been kind of hacked together. Maybe maybe not going to dig in too deep. So um, just a couple of quick notes for people who are just joining us and uh, maybe haven't seen Design Chat before. Um, this is a weekly show that started uh, just totally on Twitter. Um, some weeks we might go back to not doing the, the, uh, the video transmission, um, so that watch out for that in the future. Um, in the last three weeks, this is the fourth episode now, uh, Mashable uh, and Pete have been kind enough to uh, invite us to have our live discussion on their chat lounge, uh, the Mash Chat Lounge, which is something 
uh, that they're working out with Tiny Chat um, and has been so far, I think, very successful in starting conversation. Um, let me just start that. Uh, so again, thank you to you guys for having us for the last few weeks here. I hope it's a trend that continues because it's, I think it's starting a lot of really interesting conversations, you know, not only in the social media world, but also the design world, uh, which is a perspective that we can kind of bring to this group, which I think is really interesting. Um, so again, thank you to you guys for uh, Yeah, for and what, what I'd also that. say is that MasterChat is com completely open if people want to, uh, if people want to use it for um, their own hosted chats. If you've got, a, you know, a chat that's currently hosted on Twitter, um, we've got a few days free. If people want to kind of use the room and have a group already that they want to bring in and try it out, um, you know, it's always open to people to use. It's very, you know, solid, doesn't get hit by load or anything like that. So, you know, if anyone wants to host their own chats and they've already got a Twitter audience who will have Twitter logins because obviously they mm -hmm. need that to get in, um, it's always open for people as an opportunity. Um, something that I think is really interesting about Mashable is that, you know, in addition to you guys doing this, this uh, chat lounge, um, you're finding new ways to communicate with your audience. And uh, um, it's, it seems like part of your audience, uh, I'm not sure how you guys sort of work on identifying them, is, you know, agencies, um, marketing agencies, web design agencies, uh, social media enthusiasts. These, these worlds with social media are starting to sort of cross a little bit. When you, were, when you were starting up this blog, was that something that you envisioned or built into to who you were talking to? I mean, did you see that happening? I think audiences find you. You don't necessarily find um, the audience. Uh, we, you know, when we started out, it was all about um, kind of user-orientated reviews of new stuff that was launching on the web. So it was like, you know, we already had industry inside kind of uh, writing on these traditional uh, tech journalistic kind of properties that were coming over from the magazine world. Um, you know, Mashable is very much focused on, okay, I'm a user, uh, I want to, you know, try the features of this, what are the benefits to me? So it was very user-centric reviews of new websites. Um, and, you know, as social media kind of rose up and became a marketing tool, which it kind of wasn't then, we obviously covered that fairly heavily, we obviously use it for our own marketing. Um, and I think, you know, to some extent those agencies and those marketers and everybody found us now it's kind of a, a combination we have on one side the users who are you know people who are using these tools like Facebook and Twitter social networks on a personal level and then we have you know people who are using them for marketing and you know we have other groups who are building the tools so we have you know developers who are building spin-offs from Twitter or they're building Facebook apps they're building iPhone apps uh, so we have a kind of a, a combination of people in our audience I'd say you know there's different demographics that combine and everyone gets something different out of it so you know when we're editing during the day we're thinking okay what can we do for this group what can we do for this group and we try and you know balance it out um, so if you look today you know we've got features on you know how to use these tools but we've also got some kind of lighter weight posts that are just like you know what's bubbling up in social media and then we have you know a story about uh, Twitter so it's kind of across the range trying to balance it out it can get a bit dry if we do too many features about marketing it can get a bit uh, lightweight if we do too many uh, just kind of pieces on what's trending and what's happening right now. Is, is, there, is there a pressure at all to, to dig up current news? I mean, is there, now, I mean, there's a lot of it coming through and it, um, there, I don't want to say people, you know, rely on it, but the stream that's coming from Mashable, you know, it, it, it seems sort of unparalleled in, in a lot of other groups. Um, and because because of how fast it happens. So when something's happening right now, you know, myself and a lot of my friends, we all go to Mashable really quick. Is there sort of a pressure about about staying on top of that, and, and how do you guys manage that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, with things like Twitter, it sped it, it sped up the uh, whole news cycle a great deal. So you know, if you want to learn something within something happens and you're in it within you know 20 minutes or so, uh, you kind of lose out to some extent. Um, I think, you know, while we kind of value certain news that's of real value, you know, if something happens that we need to get out there really fast, um, for instance, you know, there's some kind of, like yesterday there was uh, a problem on Twitter, there was a, a site called TwitViewer that was just, you know, phishing people's passwords, that's obviously something we're going to turn around really fast because uh, that's kind of an urgent thing, but, you know, other topics we like to take the time, if someone's launched something and they want us to review it, we want to take the time to dig into the into the uh, service or application, test it thoroughly, and we can you know, take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to try and test it and get 
um, a kind of a, a more thoughtful uh, piece written up. So I think you've got to balance your speed and your insight and try and, uh, try and find a proposition and kind of somewhere on that scale between, you know, being really, really fast and being really, really insightful. Um, like you were saying earlier, you, were, you started to talk a little bit how you guys have observed that um, al along the way of Mashable's growth, you've observed some mistakes that you guys have made. Can you talk a little bit about that, and, like design mistakes, um, and, and and how you learn from them, and and uh, you know, and how you feel? Because, like I was saying earlier, the world of design and social media are mixing right now, and so mm -hmm. designers are heavily participating in um, how you interact with social media. Um, TweetDeck, for example, you know, it, I think has been a really interesting third-party application. Um, that I use, I use very heavily to separate groups and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe talk a little bit about, about that. You may talk about the uh, the crossover between design and, and social media. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that I I've appreciated about Twitter um, rising up is that in general sites have become. Uh, as a philosophy, less feature rich. So it's become okay to do something simple and to do it really well. And I think that's something that was missing um, as a design philosophy early on when we had 37 signals, you know, obviously trying to push the point that, you know, you can do this one or two things really, really well. Don't worry too much about having crazy amounts of features. Um, but it wasn't really a movement until maybe Twitter came along and then Facebook started cutting back on features and just going for the news feed. Um, and I do feel like that has led to a sudden kind of uprising of a bunch of applications that are incredibly simple and do, you know, one thing really, really well. Although, actually, you mentioned TweetDeck and uh, Seismic Desktop, and they're both in a feature race. So perhaps that kind of undermines to some extent that the only guys that are really going feature heavy mm -hmm. um, as a kind of a philosophy. And I think they're filling in a lot of the, uh, the gaps maybe that Twitter has decided not to tackle because they're focused on scaling. So that would be one thing I'd say that as a philosophy, the submissions we're seeing to Mashable, um, holistically as well as in design, are a lot simpler. There's a lot less to it. We can grok them a lot, lot faster. Um, whereas before, people would submit things like uh, complete social networks or MySpace clones, or they would submit some, um, you know, they would just try and build, you know, dig like sites, or they would try and add dig like features to their existing site. They would try and, you know, build on all these features and complicate things. And I think. People's philosophies in design have just become a lot, lot simpler. Uh, apps have become a lot, lot uh, faster to develop, a lot simpler. And, you know, another thing that came along was the iPhone, which also influenced simplicity and mobile influenced simplicity in design, um, and led people, I think, to design much simpler websites, which has been, you know, great for us all. You know, designing an iPhone app makes you think um, about, okay, what of my application do I really need? Um, and a lot of people have said. Like, you know, the Facebook application on the iPhone is perhaps more usable uh, than the site itself. Um, so, you know, the great, great thing about Twitter and the iPhone and the rise of uh, smartphones in general has been that people have had to think, okay, what are the essential features of my website that I can cram in there? And then they go back to their original websites and they say, well, hang on, do I really need all these extraneous features that I put on my original website? Maybe I can just simplify that too. Um, because, you know, when Twitter launched, it, it looks pretty much like a mobile website. It's just these updates that could easily be text messages. Um, and there's not a huge difference uh, between, you know, using it on a mobile or using it on, uh, on the web. So I think, you know, simplicity and, uh, you know, lack of features have both been trends we've seen in design and in applications probably over the last two years or so. Um, mainly iPhone influence and Twitter influence. How does Mashable handle design changes? I mean, do you guys have a sort of a, like a workflow and process? Um, how often does it happen? And you know, is it like a Google thing? Like Google tests the heck out of everything. Like they'll they'll test 50 shades of one color to see what gets the most clicks. It, do you guys have a testing phase or something like that? Yeah, I mean, we're we're um, we have a dev site, obviously, where we uh, you know check everything's working fine. Um, we also have. Uh, you know, we occasionally do A-B testing on ads, for instance. Um, but I think, you know, content companies 
it's probably our, our weakness that we don't focus enough on design and we don't think enough in terms of, you know, we focus so much on putting out great content that, um, you know, for instance, there are areas we really need to work on a mesh, but we need to work on mobile, we need to work on, um, you know, uh, speed in general. Um, so I think there's, there's something to be said that blogs and bloggers in general aren't focused enough on design and serving up the content. But like I said earlier, we're really, really interested in how can we get you to the content faster and maybe not have too much extraneous stuff. Yeah, there is a mobile site at m.mashable. That's a, uh, a partnership. Folks how are attracted by has, the design. Well, no, go ahead. How many times has, uh, has, it been re has it been fully redesigned a number of times? Yes. I mean, if you go to archive.org, uh, um, the Wayback Machine, I think Mashable has probably had, in four years, six designs, I would imagine. It's probably more than, more than once a year it gets a full mm -hmm. redesign. Um, you know, it gets, and, and people have this with companies, I guess, it gets more complex to do redesigns every time. Um, because you have more requirements. For instance, you'll have ongoing, you know, when you start off, you don't have ongoing ad, ad contracts that you have to fulfill. Um, so you say, oh, wait, we've got this bit of paper that says we have to include this ad here, and it has to be, you know, above the fold, and, you know, so you, you become more restricted design-wise, and that's something that people don't necessarily understand. You know, we did a redesign earlier this year, and people come to the site and, you know, they get an instant understanding of, okay, this looks pretty, or this doesn't look pretty, but they don't necessarily understand that, oh, yeah, but what you don't understand is that we need this in here because, you know, we have this agreement with a partner and we, we needed to include that there because perhaps, you know, there was some kind of uh, search engine optimization requirement there or because we had to, you know, maintain some kind of, um, you know, there were just, you know, more complexity when you do redesign and, uh, you know, I think... There is a lot we could work on in terms of design. I think, you know, where I want to go with Mashable design in particular is just focus on speed, remove more stuff. Um, it, it would be nice to serve the content even faster. Mm -hmm. um, my next sort of topic has to do with the branding of Mashable. Mashable came out at a time where, you know, um, Web 2.0 was, you know, a buzzword and, and uh, websites started to become web applications. Um, and alongside with that, in, in the design side, um, there, was, there was an aesthetic that happened. There was a Web 2.0 look um, that many sites started to adopt. Um, and because Matchable was sort of born at that time, um, there are things about it that, that sort of coincide with that movement. Um, is that something that you guys were sort of aware of as you went along? And, and what's, what's the story be, behind Matchable's sort of branding? Um, so I know what you're talking about. You're talking about things like gradients. You're talking about things like rounded corners. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember what other cliches we had. Um, the reflection. And we've still got a few kind of remnants of that, I think. Well, yeah, the reflections thing kind of came out of uh, Apple, I think, to some degree, where people wanted to have Mac-like interfaces. So that was a kind of a, at the same time, um, you know, I think... It's, you know, it's, you, you want sites to look modern, but you don't necessarily want to become cliched, and I think that's a risk with some of those Web 2.0 things, and I think people do feel that certain design elements are cliched. Um, you know, if you overdo all your gradients, or you have, you know, we, you know, we did in, uh, like, 2005 have, you know, full gradient background that faded from kind of black at the top of the page to, like, gray at the bottom, and we had a lot of, um, elements like that. I think, you know, for blogs, it's just key to focus on the content and try and not have too much of that stuff going on. And I really believe that you um, choosing to focus on the content is, is part of your branding because it builds um, what Mashable is in the, the heads of your readers uh, to be, you know, to be what it's become. Um, I'm getting the name of, of the person who wrote it uh, right now, but there, there is a there's a school of thought happening right now that that branding is is not what you say it is it's what your uh, readers or followers or consumers say it is it's it's what they believe 
uh, in their gut is uh, what you stand for. And so by focusing on content, I think that's, that's a way of building your brand. So um, I think that's a very sort of, you know, smart move to you as, it, as opposed to, like you were saying earlier, spending time on the redesign of the look and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Mash was in a good position because obviously the name has allowed us to uh, be fairly open on what the brand means. It allows us to have a little bit of flexibility. You know, we don't have a name that's necessarily, um, you know, the social blog. We don't have something that's, you know, limits us too much on whether we're in the, whether we're talking to web users, whether we're talking to, like you say, agencies, marketers, whether we're talking to uh, developers. So, you know, branding wise, it's, uh, was a good early choice for us to maybe choose something that was generic, or at least for me to choose something that was generic that allowed us some flexibility there. Um, you know, various taglines we've had over the years, we've been, you know, we were uh, social networking news early on, then we were all that's new on the web, and now we're a social media guide. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's given us some kind of flexibility around the branding of having a kind of a name that was fairly generic. How was the name chosen? Um, you know, Mashable comes from uh, Mashups, so uh, around 2005 it was really big um, trend to, you know, take, and it's still happening now, but, you know, for instance, it was Google Maps and it was Flickr and it was um, all these various applications that people were combining. So, for instance, you would put uh, Flickr photos on a Google Map or you'd say, you know, where are all the Flickr photos that are being taken right now in your area? and, uh, you know, combine web applications in that way. And now it's moved on, obviously, and we've got Twitter, which we don't even think of as kind of mashups, but essentially people using the Twitter API, combining it with other APIs. And so we have a lot of mapping mashups with Twitter, obviously. You know, you can see all the tweets and the map and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we've got mashups with Flickr. We've got mashups with virtually everything. So that trend is still going on, but that's where it kind of Mashable came from. We were in the era of open APIs. And I think we still are. I think we still have, you know, Twitter, for instance, is something that people are building on a great deal. Um, we have more of a platform era. Uh, so people are building on the iPhone platform. They're building on uh, Facebook's platform. Uh, so it's kind of continued. It's just in a different form, I guess. What different ways are you guys planning on and um, serving up your content? I mean, uh, there's, there's a popular trend like you were just talking about right now about making things open and, and allowing uh, people to develop for your content. Um, are there any new ways? Are there any things that are coming out soon or that you guys are even thinking about of new ways of developing uh, or, or, or working with your content uh, to show to uh, your users? Are you talking in terms of maybe user-generated content, um, of getting more? A little bit of user-generated kind of content, but um, but like, okay, so, so Twitter's open API is where you, um, people have access to the content and different ways of showing that content. Right. Um, so blogs essentially have APIs and it's called an RSS feed. Um, I think um, there are better ways to, um, to maybe allow people to uh, gain access to the content they want to, so we've got some directions there I can't really go into. Um, but you know, if people want to, at this point, uh, take Mashable content, filter it, and so on, they can use the RSS feed. They're welcome to do so. It's a full feed. You can put it through Yahoo Pipes um, and get whatever content you want. Um, so I think you know, blogs already, in a way, allow you to do whatever you want with their content. Um, they're not really cracking down too much. I mean, we allow people to syndicate our headlines and extracts if they want to. If people are reposting the entire uh, feed, then that's going to maybe get them in a bit of trouble. But, um, you know, a lot of people uh, take headlines, take uh, extracts, and we're not really uh, too concerned if people are linking back or if they're even quoting us and writing their own post around it. Something else that's happening right now that I think is really interesting is that there are people sort of taking on social media as a profession, and these people are coming from all walks of life. Mm. They're coming from marketing backgrounds, they're coming from design backgrounds, 
They're coming from PR backgrounds and any number of other uh, professional activities. Um, how much of that have you guys seen, uh, you know, come into your your, your content? And, uh, and do you, I don't think there's really a limit. I I think social media is something that applies to everyone, and and you know you can decide. It's like branding. You can decide how you're going to brand yourself on the internet, and anybody can do it. Um, so I think you're talking about audience, is that right? So you're talking about in terms of how we, how we're trying to bring in those audiences, is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, so as I said earlier, I think we've got some key audiences that were kind of established early on. Obviously, um, you know, for maybe like a year and a half, couple of years, we've had that marketing audience, which has been people trying to get involved in uh, social media tools for marketing. So obviously, you know, we continue to cater to them through content. Um, you know, every day we do about two, I think, feature posts on, say, um, you know, for instance, today we, we did, you know, lessons learned from um, Fish on Twitter and Facebook, you know, the band who's using that for marketing. So we do, you know, a couple a day on kind of utility. They're a bit longer. If you're kind of a user, you're going to find them a bit you know, less interesting, maybe one that you're going to skim, and then we balance that out with a kind of a user audience, which is like, um, you know, people who are using the tools. So it'd be things like, you know, how to, how to use Twitter for, you know, uh, forming groups, which is a feature that Twitter doesn't have. How can you do that? Or how to use Twitter on your iPhone? Or um, how to, you know, uh, blog comments might be an area we look at. So how do you get uh, social media content into your blog comments? How do you, um, you know? what are the best tools for really simple blogging if you're just a, kind of a beginner user. Uh, so we kind of try and cover the spectrum, we try and balance, and obviously we're not going to please everyone because we have these diverse audiences, um, but we try and balance it between thought pieces, between news, between, you know, kind of uh, something that's quirky and entertaining and then something that's a bit more meaty. Um, and that's kind of how, you know, the way you communicate with your audience when you're a blog is you do it through content. Um, and that's the way you gain audience as well. You're not going to, you know, blogs don't tend to do direct marketing, they don't tend to buy uh, search ads, um, they just continue creating content and people will find you through that content. Um, speaking of search, something that's interesting that just happened recently is Microsoft's deal with Yahoo um, and how, you know, it's kind of, they're kind of saying now that Yahoo is not going to be really involved in the search business and seeing some of these trends happen with, with Twitter and, and, and all this content that's out there right now. It, there seems to be this sort of pattern that's happening where, tell me if I'm totally crazy about this. So search was this huge thing that blew up and, and everybody's trying to make money at and these, these big fish are jumping in and, and the Yahoo's and Microsoft and Google's are all fighting about. And then we have Twitter happen and we have all these different ways of interacting with Twitter and, and information that's coming through. And like you mentioned earlier about RSS feeds, anyone has access to those sorts of things. Do you think it's possible that, you know, the, the power is going to sort of, uh, the power that search has is going to um, evolve a little bit from search to filter? Because um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Twitter is you, there's so much content. There, there's so many people on it talking about things that you want to hear about that you need to find different ways to filter out the junk and the spam and things that you're just plain old not interested in. Um, as opposed to doing specific searches for one topic, um, so there, you know, there's different ways of doing it. But I kind of, I kind of feel that the power is transitioning from search to filter. Yeah. So um, I think what you're talking about is real-time search, uh, essentially, yes. which is, you know, we we've had this this point where search used to be, hey, I want to find information that explains something. Um, you know, so for instance, you you go to Google and you'd want to find out, you want to research a topic because you're doing, you know, paper on it or whatever. Um, and that's the kind of information that doesn't change a great deal over time. It's uh, the kind of information that's a resource. Whereas what happened with real-time search, with Twitter search especially, and now Facebook's going to roll out its own uh, real-time search uh, tool at some point, which is going to do the same thing. Hey, search all your friends. What do they think about this? What are they talking about? See trends. Um, 
among all your friends. So, I mean, all that's expected from uh, Facebook very, very soon. And you have, you know, a bunch of search engines that are doing the same thing as Twitter search. You've got one riot um, and all its various competitors. Uh, so, you know, what we're really transitioning to is real-time search, which is something that Google doesn't really have a play in. I mean, they're speeding up all their core search, but they and they're bumping news to the top and things like that, but they don't really... Um, that's almost an old battle, you're right, and this is kind of why Microsoft and Yahoo are combining forces. Look, Google's got 70% market share there. Um, they want to have at least a player that can compete in that space. Um, but you're right, the ball and the kind of the focus has moved to real time and to searching amongst your friends, which is another key thing about those things. It's not just um, the fact that it's now on Twitter search and the upcoming Facebook search. It's more like not only is it now, but it's also contextual in the sense that I can search through my friends, and that's going to be really powerful when Facebook comes out with the products, because it'll be, you know, what all my Facebook friends think about this issue that's happening right now. Um, so I think that's, it's definitely a huge and, and powerful transition, and there is a sense in which that's an old battle, that whole, um, you know, uh, search battle between Google and Yahoo, although, you know, it's, it's still a huge, huge uh, market, it's just that, you know, the, the uh, cutting edge of that market has moved to a place where it's real time and where it's about your friends and I think Google's definitely making uh, strides to be in that market as well. We, we, we talked a little bit about uh, portable devices earlier um, and, and this is something that I think is of, of great interest to me, you know, in both the design world and the social media world. Um, where the ways that you interact with these portable devices and the ways that they're designed, you know, like a, like a Kindle or even a BlackBerry, the iPhone, these sort of things, um, that seems to be evolving very quickly. Do you have favorite sort of devices that you use? Um, and, and, you know, how, how do you look for them and how do you interact with them? Do you have things, specific things that you use all the time? Yes, yeah, so I'm obviously an iPhone fan and, you know, what the iPhone did and Obviously, we're talking design, and I think what what the iPhone did was simplified a lot of um, uh, device design. It kind of uh, made it uh, made people question why there were so many buttons on things. And I think Apple had been doing that for pretty much. I mean, Steve Jobs had been a no buttons kind of guy uh, since forever, and it'd been you know there were obviously some points like the the mice that refused to have two buttons on them. I think there were some points where it went a bit far, but in general. Um, you know, I think Apple did a really good job of moving forward device design. I'm a huge iPhone fan. I'm on a Mac right now. Um, so I guess I'm a Mac fanboy. I guess that's my uh, philosophy on devices. I um, kind of don't put up with too much complexity. So I think, you know, in terms of design, that's been a big trend. I think smartphones are obviously going to be a huge trend. We're going to have big touch screens. We're going to have less buttons. But I still actually quite uh, yearn for the tactile keyboard and I'm interested to see I'm sure you've seen all this buzz happening about um, Apple Tablet which is mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe going to come in fall I mean there's September is kind of the earliest uh, date that's been floated for that and that's going to be really interesting for designers and I've, I've actually been interested in your thoughts about um, you know what value designers could get out of the Apple Tablet whether it's going to be you know a kind of a new wave in design when uh, potentially you could be interacting with a device um, that's got a huge screen, it's going to be touch screen, it's going to be multi-touch, presumably you can kind of really get in there, use your hands, it won't be like, you know, it won't be the kind of the interaction you have with the laptop which is much less suited to this creative pursuits. This is something that I'm very interested in. This is something I talk about all the time. Um, you know, the design profession has completely evolved over the last 50 years. I mean, even in, over the last 20 years, 20 years ago, you know, we, we were still using cameras, taking photos of physical layouts that people would mm. use exacto knives to cut out little pieces of type with. You know, and, and now uh, it, it's moved so quickly that, you know, it's, it's hard to keep up with the, the changes in, you know, especially like the Adobe software, which is what the majority of the uh, industry uses. Um, that's the next thing, that, the next step that I, that I tell people I'm really excited for is how is Adobe going to react? Um, to these new interfaces and I would imagine um, they're probably developing as fast as they can right now because they're going to be anticipating Apple doing something like this and, and and working on not only you know 
uh, how, how do you scale an image, but how you airbrush it, you know, how you add filters to it, how, how you transition from, uh, from file to file, and, and how you place documents and other documents. I mean, there are so many things I, I could totally nerd out on that and talk for the next two hours, but I won't bore you with the details. But, but yeah, this is something that's very interesting to me. Um, HP came out with a touch screen, uh, flat screen, uh, iMac sort of clone. Uh, yeah, that was a while ago. That, I mean, that was like three years ago or something like that. And it's something that as soon as I heard about it, I got very excited about it. And I was like, wow, somebody got to jump on Apple. And then I went and saw it, and the operating system is, it was the standard Windows thing, which isn't meant for touch screen at all. So in, in my eyes, it was a complete fail and a complete disappointment. Um, so yeah, in September, I'm very excited to see what happens with the rumored tablet, but I still think it's going to be some time before that translates to the design profession um, because, because of all the software that's going to have to be updated to deal with that and training. Yeah, but I think, you know, it's very different uh, Mac doing it from, say, HP doing it. I mean, Mac already has the built-in. Anyone who is, you know, interested in aesthetics, anyone who's interested in usability is probably going to be on a Mac already. Or, um, you know, if they can afford it, they're going to be on a Mac. Um, so I think it makes a big, big difference if, if, uh, if Apple do it as opposed to someone like HP. And obviously, like you said, the OS. Um, we're going to assume it's going to have the full OS. We're going to assume it's not going to have, uh, hopefully, some version of the iPhone OS, which would be useless, I think, on a on a device that size. Um, I think it could really make big waves. I think we we definitely did a post on it about you know how many people would be interested in this device, how many might buy it, and I think it was about 60% like the concept mm -hmm. would actually consider it. It'll really depend on price point. I think someone just posted in there and said, you know, is it under 800? It, you know, the rumored price point has been around 800, which is, you know, low for Apple, high for devices in general. Um, I think we're really going nice to see this happen really stripped waves. down device that was cheap. I think we're going to see this, but, this happen in waves, where the where the tablet comes out and the general public becomes interested in touchscreen um, computing beyond portable devices, where, where the tablet is a portable device, but it's also sort of a, a laptop-sized device. And I think there's going to be a wave that happens after that for the professional world, professional design world, rather, um, that, you know, after the sort of the, the first wave of accept, um, acceptance comes, um, there's going to be a learning curve, and then they're going to start applying that to, to higher-level computing uh, for, for are you saying that's because the, it's going to take a while for the software to get up to speed with the hardware? You know, because of all the kind of new abilities that are going to be uh, kind of unleashed? I think it's a software problem, and I think it's, a, it's an education problem. Because, you know, it's, it's like when the mouse first came out, people, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, oh, I'm going to forget who, Xerox invented the mouse. Uh, and people, you know, they tried to sell it around, and nobody could wanted to buy it because it's like, how? Why would I interact with a computer with that thing? That's very odd. So it's a new way of interacting with your machine that people are going to be slow to adopt. Yeah. Um, but what I would also say is that it's probably going to follow the price point is going to probably follow the same trajectory as iPhone, which is that iPhone came out incredibly expensive, early adoptive type tool, um, and now we've got I think 99 buck iPhones. Um, so it's really kind of the price point has come right, right down. I mean, they're selling with a contract, and maybe uh, tablets um, can't really subsidize on contracts because they're not necessarily going to. Um, yeah, 49 bucks for a refurbished 3G, apparently. Um, you know, maybe the price point won't be able to come down quite so much on the device with a tablet because it doesn't have the contracts attached. But I still think that it's going to be a case where it maybe comes out at this $800 price point and then falls. I, I really hope they can start making affordable devices that can be, um, you know, reach kind of wider audiences. I have to both agree with you and disagree on this because I think the price point is going to be very important for the general public and the tablet PC, uh, for people who are going to be using it maybe in the medical field or, you know, in, in smaller professions or something like that. But I think when we're talking about hardware, touchscreen hardware that's intended for the professional level, um, the machines that uh, the design industry works on right now, that the Tower Macs, 
loaded with as much power and, and RAM as you can fill them with, those are very common in the design mm. industry. Um, and, so, and those price points are extremely high. But they're being paid uh, for by corporations and design firms and web design firms who are bringing in income as opposed to uh, the casual user or the casual blogger or something like that. So I think that's why I'm seeing two different tiers. I'm seeing the, um, I'm seeing the public acceptance and I'm seeing the professional acceptance as being two different waves of, of Apple introducing that sort of thing. And in, you see it going in the order of kind of a, a, the consumer, well, the kind of the independent freelance designer kind of understanding it first, is that right? And then perhaps it taking a while for them to extend the budgets in the kind of the bigger design firms and say, okay, now we've got to equip everyone with a tablet. Very much so, because I think um, because of all the hype that surrounds touchscreen and the iPhone, that's their market. And, and that's where they're going to focus uh, creating their revenues, because in the tablet form, um, they're going to make their money in subscriptions and, and, uh, and then iTunes uh, application downloads um, rather than selling the, the devices. So once that's in place, I think it builds a platform to extend itself to the professional world. How do you think it's going to change design, though? I mean, once you have this interaction, um, which is essentially going to be multi-touch on a really big screen, uh, do you think that's going to become de facto for design? I mean, why would you have preference for a mouse when you can actually get hands-on? I think, I think it's going to have the same, um, I think it's going to follow the same path as when computers were first introduced. I think there's going to be a slow adoption into uh, the professional design world where you're going to have guys who have been working for 20, 30, 40 years on, you know, and, and they've had to transition from cut and paste, physical cut with scissors and paste to computers. And at the end, part of their, um, uh, their, their, what's the word I'm looking for? Profession, you know, they're about to retire in five, ten years. They're not going to want to learn a new way of interacting. Um, I think the same thing happened when the computer was introduced. So I think you're going to have, like, the smaller, younger, sort of hip, trendy uh, design shops are going to adopt it faster. Um, I think the larger agencies, the BBDOs, the Leo Burnett's, you know, Ogilvy's, that sort of thing, I think the huge agencies are going to adopt it slower, and it'll slowly creep into um, the design profession because of so many things that are going to have to be uh, relearned. You know, there are processes in place for these large agencies that are extremely complex, um, that involve so many people in red tape. Um, and, and I think once something so dramatic like this is introduced, it takes a long time to embrace and work its way into these. Yep, that makes sense. Um, do we want to take some questions from uh, chat? I know people keep being yeah, in there. Yeah, thank you very much. So. Questions. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at 50 minutes in. We're almost at an hour. I think this is a great time to do it. Maybe tweet it again and uh, we'll get some more people into questions as well. I will send it out also. Chatting live in design chat. Um. Hmm. Be it SES? No, for not. Um. Both of you talk your tweets out loud. That's hilarious. That's because we can't multitask. Um. Again? Yeah, design chat is at Hubbajub, is that even it's that? Hubbajub? Oh, Hoopajub, H U P A J O O B. There we go, someone's um, spelling yeah, in. Yeah, I kind of forgot to do that at the intro. Uh, my name is Ryan McGovern. Uh, we do design chat every single week. Um, you can see more information at designchat.info. I'm an art director. Uh, I work at an agency called Aspen uh, Marketing Solu uh, Solutions and uh, uh, Services, rather. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Aspen uh, Marketing Services in West Chicago, Illinois, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm from Chicago, uh, born and raised. Actually, uh, I was in 
the week before I talked to you, actually, we should tell a little history real quick. Um, I jumped in on a chat with you and PR Sarah Evans, and you were talking about mm -hmm. PR and social media. And uh, at, at the end of the chat, you were doing something similar to this. We're taking questions from the audience, and I mentioned design chat. And, and Pete mm -hmm. jumped on that right away, and he was like, hey, you know, if you want to broadcast from the Mass Chat Lounge, uh, you're more than welcome. And I, I took that opportunity right away, and, you know, I, it, like I said earlier, I hope it's a trend that continues uh, because it's wor been working out great for both parties, I think. And, um, sure. and that's kind of how this live streaming thing started uh, for design chat. Yeah, well, the room's here if people want to use it. Um, we, you know, we have it available if people want to do, you know, weekly uh, Can I slow chat. Down my I'm already doing one on Twitter. Yeah. Um, Are there other weekly discussions that happen? Um, we haven't set them up yet. I mean, we're doing our, um, we're getting back on track with some of our own internal stuff. Um, and we do kind of, uh, when there's a live event on, we open it up. Um, so, for instance, when uh, when Facebook launched the usernames, uh, which is a few weeks back now, um, you know, we were there live at Facebook. Uh, we do from events, conferences, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's, you know, right now it's, hey, we wait for a big event, um, but it would be nice to have some more, uh, some more regular um, chats in here if people want to join. Uh, we got any design-related questions? Did we miss someone? Victor we Pinto cast? is asking what the most important thing uh, would be about transferring from a mouse interaction to a touchscreen interaction. And I really think that's going to, it's going to depend on the software. I think the, the platform that we work in is going to be the most important thing. I think Apple, of course, is going to handle their Finder solutions um, in the most elegant way. I'm not worried about that part of it. What I'm, where I'm concerned with is, are the other applications that we depend on every day. Right. What kind of apps? Um, Photoshop, Illustrator, mm -hmm. InDesign, Dreamweaver, Flash, yes, um, the whole stuff. Adobe suite. Um, at Quark at this point has pretty much died. I mean, there are some production houses that use it and depend on it pretty heavily. I know there was a new version of it that came out. I, I don't see it. Um, they're probably going to be the last of anybody to, to adopt the touchscreen. I, I, would, I would predict that years into the touchscreen phase, Quark will still be mouse and keyboard. And that we're probably going to develop uh, words for that. You know, I'm sure there are going to be terms that, that come off for that. Well, the questions are coming the quick. School, mouse and keyboard. But yeah. you're saying it's almost like a complete transition that we're almost not going to have the, uh, the whole mouse and keyboard set up anymore. I hope so. I, I really hope that's the way it goes. I think... Um, I'm kind of unsure outside of the design industry if that's going to make sense because, uh, you know, a laptop with a keyboard and um, would seem to kind of, you know, be a better model if you're kind of in an industry that's text-based. I don't see the compu I don't. I should rephrase. I don't see the keyboard as completely vanishing. Um, I see it vanishing in certain types of activities, um, and I see it. I see that trend happening slowly. Um, we'll probably still have, as these touchscreens come out, we'll probably still have options for mouse and keyboard, um, because there are going to be those applications that won't develop for it right away. But yeah, I, I have to agree with that. Okay. Um, this is our question. Did you see that one about do low tech gadgets piss you guys off like having to use bulky plastic card reader at the grocery store? Um, it takes it takes a while for uh, for technology to uh, to make its way um, to the high street or wherever you want to call that um, to the ATM. Um, so I think you've got to tolerate some of that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that you know it's a kind of shame that um, some of these uh, industrial design groups are are sort of slow to they're slow moving groups. Um, I th I think that uh, you know there are companies that do it very well, like the, the apples of the world. I think you know in everyday life you're going to encounter objects there's a really cool movie out right now by a, a director and, and producer and writer extraordinaire uh, Gary Hutswit and it's called Objectified this is the same guy who did the Helvetica movie 
And uh, I think if you're interested in industrial design at all, that, that's a must-see. It's a must-see because it, it, it works. It talks about um, everything in your world. Look around your room, anywhere that you happen to be. Every object that you see has been designed by somebody. Some sort of thought has gone into why that object looks the way it does and, and how you touch it and how you work with it. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a world of design that people see every day, but they don't really realize that they see it and they, they interact with it. And I think, you know, some of these groups are very slow, uh, you know, to develop it, and they're slow-moving uh, groups who, who just, you know, they don't react. They obviously aren't working in, you know, dealing with social media because they don't, de they don't listen to uh, consumers as to how these objects should be working. Right, but also the pressures are different. I mean, there's a lot of price pressure on industrial design in terms of, hey, you've got to make this ATM for X many dollars, and if this other company is making it really fancy, but they're... Uh, um, their cost structures can be a lot, lot higher if they're constantly changing. It's not like ATMs evolve in the same way as smartphones, where you're, you know, actually considering. I mean, there was a good. Uh, I think it's someone like um, Seth Godin who has one of his slides in one of his presentations where he had a picture of a factory where they had um, a kind of. A, I think it was a machine for you know stamping letters on on signage or something, and you could see that like three of the buttons on the on the machine were completely worn out and none of the other buttons had ever been used. And, you know, machines are made uh, in factories for, you know, at scale, so that you can have a situation where you can just, you know, roll them out, that conveyor belt style, and it's not necessarily the case where you can uh, adjust that model. It's not the same as consumer electronics, where they can constantly evolving for use cases. Um, there's very much a pressure on cost. There's very much... Uh, so, really think the industrial designers at those companies are equally frustrated that they can't make uh, devices that are both, you know, consumer friendly, appealing, good looking, and do the job. They're very much constrained by uh, by other factors, and design isn't really um, isn't really something that has a great deal of flexibility. Um, Nick Hanafy just asked, "Do you think it's strange that we uh, tweet about Twitter all the time?" And I think that's kind of a funny question, you know, um, because, it, you know, it's this new media that, that's come out, and I think we can draw parallels to, you know, the time when the TV came out, and um, so much discussion and arguing happened about the TV and whether or not you should allow that in your home, um, and, allow, and accepting, that, accepting that in your daily lifestyle. And I think that's the kind of period that we're in right now, because Twitter is new and people are using how to use, learning how to use it, um, that's what that's part of the conversation and when that gets accepted I think that will plateau and then the real you know amounts of uh, content start coming through that media that's true well, but uh, to the same token I mean yes it's new and yes it's novel and yes people are trying to understand what it means and how it works but at the same token all media is self-referential newspapers talk about what other newspapers are writing about TV shows comment on what other TV shows just said you watch the CNN, they're talking about what someone just said on Fox. You go on Fox, they're talking about what someone just said on CBS. I mean, it's just all very, very self-referential. That's, that's the way media is. And uh, I think, you know, Twitter, you know, social media communities are also quite self-referential. If you go to Dig, um, then at least one top story on Dig, and it's become less so. Actually, as Dig has evolved, if you go to a site like that, one of the stories every day is going to be about Dig, or um, Twitter stories, the most shared stories are going to be focused on Twitter. Um, social media is a little bit self-referential because that's the one thing that ties the entire community is the fact that they use Twitter. There's very little else that really ties them. Um, and, you know, media itself is very self-referential. So, yes, it will plateau, but also I think it's going to... Um, always be a case that everyone on Twitter is kind of united by that single fact that they use Twitter, so they're going to talk about it. Um, I, for, I didn't see the name because it went by too quick, but somebody was just asking about what you think about um, all types of media going digital, newspapers, magazines, so really they're talking about print media sort of dying. Do you think that's even possible? Well, I mean, print obviously is dying. I think uh, there's a separate question of whether there will still be a market for journalism and whether there will still be a market for what they're doing, and obviously there will be. Um, 
But those guys have been so slow to make the transition. They still haven't made the transition. Um, we still don't have a case where we have... Um, none of our major rivals um, are established, really established tech publications. In our perspective, what we cover is not something that's well covered by um, the kind of the previous crop. And maybe we're alone in that view, but I think, you know, to the same extent that... Um, I just don't think a lot of that media has moved online and is competing online and it's gonna because these things are kind of cumulative and because uh, you know once you reach critical mass you have the most value because you have the most comments and so on um, they were doing smart to make the transition a lot lot earlier and I think you know it's that whole innovators dilemma type thing where they had such an established audience for that whole newspaper thing they didn't expect it to go away quite so rapidly the economy turned around, it sped up the decline, um, and I still don't think that, uh, you know, newspapers are doing a really amazing job in blogging. If you look at political blogging and you look at news blogging, it's people like the Huffington Post uh, who are actually, you know, driving traffic and making strides there rather than, you know, the, the newspapers having uh, their own, own brands in-house kind of blogging. T.R. Griff asks, journalism schools refuse to adopt social media and marketing. They see it as a, a, a lack of integrity. Do you agree with that? Do I'm unsure that? that's true. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, the core principles of journalism have always been there and have always been, um, you know, still apply. Um, so I think if journalism schools are teaching the high, high level, um, you know, this is how you uh, find reliable sources, this is how you check your sources, here are the principles of, um, you know, writing really good copy, you know, put all the interesting stuff really close to the top. Um, you know, all those general rules of journalism still apply. I, you know, I am, I am hearing increasingly about journalism schools that are uh, integrating social media into the courses. The challenges they have are that stuff that you learn the first year of the course, if it's too focused on kind of the new and the novel and hey his Twitter and his Facebook is going to be outdated by the last year of the course um, so I think we need to focus on general principles rather than specific uh, tools you know you don't want to have a course that's essentially Twitter 101 um, because by the time you finish that course it's going to be outdated all right we got a couple more minutes here I think for uh, a few more mm -hmm. questions and I think we're going to start wrapping up okay uh, here come the questions I know I can't read them because they're going too fast got to be careful about announcing those things, I guess. Someone's asking, what's the next Twitter? Um, we're getting a bit off of the design chat thing, but I think it's worth picking that one up. Um, I think maybe, you know, there's not going to be a next Twitter, because Twitter is something, um, or at least there's not going to be a next Twitter within the next uh, kind of six months to a year. Nothing has, nothing has shown itself to be the kind of the seed of something that's going to be absolutely huge. Um, what I would say is that location is going to be very, very big. So first first off, the, the next thing to follow Twitter or the next thing to be big in the social media space is probably going to build off the back of things like Twitter. You've got to, you know, how are people going to find out about this thing? Probably through Twitter. Um, so it's going to be something that's related to it, that uses it in its marketing. I mean, we had the same thing with... Um, you know, it's quite an old story that YouTube actually built up a lot of its early traction off the back of MySpace and allowing embeds in MySpace. Um, and they were driving a bunch of traffic from MySpace and it became, uh, actually MySpace tried to block them for a little bit and there was a bit of competition there and MySpace tried to launch its own video site. Um, but launching off the back of something else is, is a story we hear many, many times. And actually the whole era of, of uh, of popular websites that launched at that time were building off the back of MySpace. We have Photobucket, which got very, very big off the back of MySpace. Uh, we had um, uh, Slide, which was a kind of a rival to them. It did like all these widgets and, you know, all these companies are still around. Obviously, we had ImageHack. All these companies got huge off the back of MySpace and that whole ecosystem. So whatever's going to be big next is going to build out the back of an ecosystem. It's going to build on the Facebook ecosystem or the iPhone ecosystem. We've already got some leaders there. Um, and it's likely to grow up the, the Twitter ecosystem. So, you know, one thing that we highlighted was something called uh, Foursquare, 
which is going to be, or which is already, and it's taking off in New York and San Francisco and other. Is it in San Francisco? I've seen it very much in uh, in New York. Um, Foursquare is essentially location plus Twitter. Um, so you can uh, check into various places. You say, hey, I'm here. Um, and then it'll post to your Twitter, but also it's kind of a game. So it's an iPhone app, I should say, that's limited, I think, uh, currently. Um, yes, in SF. It's very popular in SF. Of course it is. Um, it's kind of location plus uh, Twitter. And it's a game, so you can get badges. So, for instance, you, you know, check in a certain place a lot. You become the mayor of that place. Um, so it's kind of an interactive, location-based game plus Twitter. So it's got a lot of uh, appealing aspects there. It's a game, so it's very competitive. It's a lot of fun. It's also got uh, the Twitter integration, which allows it to be broadcast to, you know, say you've got 1,000 followers on Twitter. Every time you're checking in, somebody will ask you to 1,000 new people. They say, hey, what's this Foursquare? So it has that kind of viral... Um, that viral uh, momentum, uh, which we kind of saw in the, the MySpace type era with like Photobocket and with uh, with YouTube and with all the sites that grew off the back of that. So I think Foursquare is a good pick for um, for what's coming up. Google Wave, Google Wave is actually a good example of something that will be very very big. Uh, when we say the next Twitter, someone just introduced that. By the way, I wasn't just randomly saying Google Wave. Um, you know, and that is actually an example of something that would be very big, and when people say, what's the next Twitter, we tend to think of what's the next small thing that's going to become really big, rather than what's the next thing within a really big company that's um, that's about to kind of take off, because Google actually has something that could end up being, well, it already is, in a sense, a lot bigger than uh, Foursquare. It's called, uh, uh, geez, it just escaped me. Don't remind me what Google's location-based thing is. Um, and also, you know, Google Wave is going to be very, very big. It's going to change latitude. That's the one. Thank you. Uh, Google Latitude is very much uh, location-based. Built, you know, they can build it into Google Maps. They have a lot of distribution there. Uh, uh, Wave Google is going to be very, very big. That video that came out uh, not too long ago on Google Wave and how it's going to work and the development team that was talking about it, I only got about halfway through it. But even with with seeing that much of it. My jaw was on my desk. Um, oh, it's amazing. We've got um, we've got access to Google Wave, and we did some demos. I think we can do some more demos on uh, on Mash Chat. I think it's very much going to change the way oh, that yeah. you interact with content. Uh, you know, one of the things it does is that you know, in chat, while you're actually chatting, rather than you having to submit the chat, it goes letter by letter. So I'm kind of intrigued to see how it's Very definitely going to so. change our chat behavior. You'll be a little more thoughtful before you, uh, before you maybe start typing. Um, but I, you know, what I am excited about with things like Google Wave is that I really hate email. I mean, it's just such a pain. Uh, you know, one of the great, great things about Twitter and Facebook as they sprung up for messaging is that it's kind of, you can, it supports one-way relationships really, really well. Um, it's kind of more like real life, where I have to get your attention before I can uh, kind of reach out to you, which you know is is kind of a more realistic model. Um, you know, email email has a lot of problems. Uh, essentially, it's very very time consuming and has very little rewards. So I think um, you know, Wave might kind of change that and kind of evolve how we communicate. And you know, there'll be disadvantages because there'll be time stuff which might mean there's a lot uh, kind of more people reaching out to you immediately and want demanding an immediate response it could have a negative effect in that sense but in the same sense it might kind of clean up email a little bit um, and turn it more real time and make it more useful someone earlier was asking um, I forget the name of who it was that we, we were talking about how design and social media are starting to sort of cross paths a little bit and they were asking for examples of what agencies might be doing that um, there is a group called uh, uh, Crispin, Porter, and Bogusky, and uh, mm -hmm. we're going to tweet the, uh, they've got a beta site up right now that we talked about, I think, two weeks ago with Red Square Agency, um, and uh, they're doing something really interesting right now with a beta site where it, instead of the traditional agency sort of website, it's uh, loaded with flash and animations, that sort of thing, it's a stagnant um, feed of, of information and their work. So they've got videos of their latest commercials. 
They've got a Twitter feed coming in. Um, I forget all the things, but they, ha they have a number of things happening all at the same time. And I think, so they're experimenting in it, and, and I think it's interesting so far. I don't know if it's something that they're going to adopt as their, their regular site and take it out of beta. Um, right now, it seems like the beta site sort of is for the other agencies and for the agency world to sort of talk about. So that's one. Um, uh, but there was a there there was a subject I wanted to talk to you about Pete um, with about about social media and I guess it's not so much of a di design thing but we're we've been straying a little bit so I'll stay on that path. Um, so I, what we're seeing I, I've experienced a few things so far in uh, in doing design chat and getting it started and off the off the ground where um, you know negative feedback or something like that or someone arguing about something um, and you, you witness a lot of people and it's like email if, you, if you're angry and you write an email you can send it off and then you realize kind of what you've done and uh, I'm seeing this sort of thing happen where um, I think people are relearning how to be social and I think they're relearning um, the rules that you of social engagement you know where you know you, you had the TV introduced in the 50s and you, you went from societies that lived on the street and walked around from shops like a European sort of society to people living inside their living rooms and not talking to their neighbors for years, weeks, months. Um, and, and now that we have this capability of being on the internet and communicating in so many different ways, it almost seems like people are relearning how to interact. Have you seen or participated in any of that? You know, one of the things that um, that's said about this whole social media wave trend is that it's somehow like, why would I want to do that? That's abnormal. Why would I want to? Why would anyone care what I think? Why would I want to communicate online? Why would I want to post these little messages? Why would I want to add comments to media? Um, you know, people think in terms of publishing being something very, very big. It's got to be perfect before it goes out there. You know, they think, why would I want to? You know, publish a blog post. I'm not a writer. I'm not a journalist. Won't it have to be perfect? Shouldn't I spend days perfecting it? Um, you know, publishing is this big word, it's this big idea, it's got to, you know, it's got to have these certain rules, am I a journalist? Um, and, you know, people said, you know, when YouTube came along, like, oh, I want to make a really great video, they had all these hang-ups about, you know, just going on video and just talking and communicating, because what they've been used to up until this point was this very professional, edited, all the media we consumed was professional, and that was actually an anomaly, that was actually not something, you know, this whole period of television and mainstream media and newspapers, it was kind of an anomaly in, in human society. It wasn't, it wasn't something that had ever been around before and it perhaps isn't going to continue going forward. So we're going to have a much more um, uh, kind of focus on user-generated content. We're going to have uh, a kind of a scale of amateur to professional content. Um, and it's not even going to be content, it's just going to be communication. So, you know, I think one of the key things to remember is that before television, radio, newspapers, etc., we had a period where we'd all communicate with each other. One-to-one, um, -one we had, you know, content, communication, the same thing. Uh, then we moved to this period whereby we had content that we consumed. Um, and we watched TV and we read newspapers and it wasn't quite so interactive. And now, we're in a sense, we're kind of reverting to a period before uh, mainstream media where we're all communicating one-to-one -one, um, or many-to-many -many. and I think you're right it's kind of a relearning of that whole um, uh, living in a very social society um, so yes I would tend to agree that um, we're kind of returning to that but I'd also say that the whole mainstream media thing it's not strange that we're going from mainstream media to social media it's strange that we had this period where we thought it was okay to just consume media um, where we thought that all media was supposed to be one-to-one -one and that all communication and content had to be perfect and professional and otherwise it wasn't worth doing. Great point, great point. And I think, I think we're going to end on that point. I think we're at about an hour and 15 on the chat. Um, it's run a little bit long, so I think uh, when this goes up on the site, we're going to split it up into part one and part two. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm going to do a couple wrap-up things here. Um, first of all, thank you, Pete, for coming on. Uh, this has been an amazing experience. Um, and also thank you for uh, allowing Design Chat to live in the Mass Chat Lounge. No problem. That's been a really cool thing. Um, a couple notes here. Uh, Design Chat, this is Des Design Chat 15. 
We do this every week. Um, if it's not on a video thing, it, it'll live in Twitter. Look for the hashtag Design Chat. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Hoopajoob, H-U-P-A-J-O-O-B. We'll, we'll send that link out. Um, and at Design Chat, um, the website's designchat.info. And Pete, of course, is at Mashable uh, and Mashable.com. Um, thank you to Samata Mason. Uh, we're broad, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, we're at SamataMason.com, uh, uh, and we're broadcasting from there. It's a, an agency in West Dundee, Illinois. They're doing very cool things. They've got a conference coming up called the CUSP Conference, um, and that's happening in September, and that's a design conference. Uh, it's a little bit different from a normal design conferences where they bring in uh, all sorts of people who Invol are involved in design experiences, but aren't necessarily from design backgrounds. So be on the lookout for that. So um, let me see. Am I forgetting to thank anybody? Nope. Uh, again, thank you, Pete. This has been really cool. Thank you. It's been really awesome. And what we also uh, let people do at the very end of our chats is uh, post their Twitter names because people love to do some self promotion. Oh, yeah, definitely. So just as we sign out, if people want to uh, post their Twitter names in the chat so you can find each other. Uh, that'll be perfect, and we're going to sign out. Uh, the chat will stay on, but uh, we'll sign out a video, and then we'll close the uh, the chat room. Maybe like five, ten minutes. Okay, so I'm signing out in uh, three, two, one. Bye, Ryan. Bye. See ya. I'll stay on for a couple more minutes here, um, or not a couple, a couple more seconds. Uh, watch out for the. Uh, uh, the video when it comes out, and that's going to be on designchat.info. And I'm sure we have people here tonight from uh, both the social media world and the design world. If you guys have any suggestions of who you'd like to see on a discussion, uh, don't hesitate to send, send it to me. Uh, again, I'm at Hoopajoob on Twitter. Um, so thank you for everybody uh, for coming tonight, and uh, we'll see you again very soon.